Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome back on the show. We have a sit down with Moto2 ace Jake Dixon, and yes, as you can imagine, absolute carnage ensues. We also pick up on the recent Anna Carrasco, Alvaro Bautista controversy. Uh, Rossi's back on two wheels in the news as well. We've got more launches and more news out of those launches, although they are just livery launches, so nothing really juicy coming out of them. Uh, but it does mean we are getting closer and closer to the 2023 season properly kicking off. The recording date is Wednesday, the 1st of February. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me, as always, is Crash Moto GP editor Pete McLaren and former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewin. Uh, but before anything, we thought we would dive straight in with Jake Dixon. We caught up with him last week. Well, Jake, welcome to the Crash Moto GP podcast. What a pleasure it is uh, to have you on. Um, how is the off season going at the moment? It looks like you're, you're busy on your Instagram, hiking up uh, hills and running after dogs. Yeah, no, it's good. Uh, just out here in Spain, we do it every year. Um, out here for four weeks, so yeah, it's been going good. Actually, today was not so good, but anyway, uh, I put oh. it this way: I had a long time rebuilding a bike, so yeah. <laughs> You can imagine what happened. So no, it's all good. <laughs> you live to tell the tale. <laughs> exactly, exactly, mate. Exactly. <laughs> Jake, now we've got you. We don't want to waste all of our time and try to to get you nailed down to, if I can, early personal stuff. If I can with you, I know. Yep. That, you know, you've come from a long way. Dad Darren was yep. a motorcycle racer, two wheels and three wheels. Yeah, you've had. A lot of pressure over the last few years with Moto G, Moto Two, obviously, but also at home, family-wise, difficult yeah. year. You're racing in the most probably complicated and most competitive era ever in motorcycle racing, yeah. and yet you still manage to keep that personality cracking on and and having fun with it. I mean, how tough has it been to get to where you are now? <laughs> Yeah, obviously it's difficult um, with certain circumstances that happen. That's just life, though. Um, and it's made me who I am today. So uh, I'm grateful for what I've become through them circumstances. Obviously, oh, you would certain things you would not like to happen because obviously other people suffer from certain things in just general life. Um but other than that, motorcycle racing is not the be all or end all. Uh, and that's something that I actually have learned to, to realize over the last few years. Uh, 2019, especially when I rode first time in Moto2, um, I struggled so much with the team, bike, everything. Um, traveling the world was just all so out of sorts. And actually, at that time, I was struggling with depression really bad because I'd gone from doing really, really well to, to doing really, really bad. And that's something in motorcycle racing that's super hard and super difficult to deal with. And I didn't want to continue racing after that year. But then obviously signed with the Patronus team for 20 and 21. And uh, the, I started getting going really good in 20 uh, with having top fives, uh, leading races, and then unfortunately broke my wrist. And then 21 never really got going. It was super difficult. Uh, struggled with the team, the the crew chief I'd struggled with from day dot. Um, and then obviously the team it exploded and uh, had no money and no resources, no nothing. And I thought, oh God, how have I gone from 20 being at the front to 21 not even being in the top 15 and struggling? Um, and yeah, I went from the last race in Valencia with Patronus to the first test in Aspar and I was quickest. It was all just such a, just like my head, I couldn't get around everything, but last year was great. Like I say, Keith, I've learned so much. Obviously I've been the one that everyone's relying on lately to, to bring the results because Sam was obviously injured this year. But I like it. I like stepping up to the plate. I knew that I can do it and I'm always going to back myself. Um, and I generally feel this year I can win the championship. I think that most people think that. I mean, you're right at the front end, the sharp end of things. And th yeah. that race win, I mean, like, it's been stolen from you a couple of times. Yeah. But we won't go there because you just won't yeah. like that. <laughs> I mean, outside influences. I mean, Frankie Carcetti, your manager, he's a yeah. good lad and knows everything about everything from behind the scenes. Wife, Sarah, is 
built for motorcycle racing at the end of yeah. the day from her family connections and so on and so forth. Your dad back in the day. How much influence do outside people have on you? You're your best buddies with with Cotoaro, which is, yeah. is, is not, hey, I mean, genuinely, it's not just for, for show of the camera. You guys get on really, really well. How much do these outside influences have on your performance, do you think? Yeah, I think everything everything helps, you know, and I think with Frankie, is he's got me to where I am now. Dad got me so far, then Frankie came on board and wanted to manage me and, He's believed in me from day dot. He's always said to me, I'm going to be a MotoGP one day. And he still stands by that. And he stood by me the whole way through it. So for for him, I can't thank him enough for what he's done for me. And um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a relationship that is built on respect. Um, I respect him. He respects me. And um, he does everything for me that that needs to be done. So, and he's well respected in the paddock. And obviously, my wife Sarah, she gets the game. Uh, she understands the job, and she's my biggest fan, my biggest supporter, and um, obviously my biggest lover in certain things. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um, but no, and then obviously Fabio. Fabio helps me where he can. Um, do you know what? It's funny because he helps me in certain things, and then there's certain things that people don't see off camera where I can help him, you know, like in uh, Phillip Island, he crashed. I was one of the first people to go see him. I knew it was a time that he needed me. And I said to him, um, I says, look, mate, I'm not going to bullshit you. I'm, I'm here when you need me. I'm not here to buff you when you, when you need your ego buffeting because I'm not that person. I'm that person that will be with you when you're down and tell you, that you're good when you're down because that's when you need me. That's when a friend, you need a friend. So we work, we work well together and um, he, he believes in me and he always says to me, he will push as much as he can on, on the side of things with Yamaha to try and hopefully one day get me a ride there because he says with what I done in them two wild cards was more than what everyone's done jumping on the Yamaha. So yeah. It, I have such a good uh, relationship around me. Um, and, yeah, I think it's something that's obviously really, really nice to have. And uh, I'm learning day by day, taking things as they come and uh, just enjoying life. This is about the most serious I think I've ever seen you to speak to. I mean, the media generally. Hey, you, I you have to be now. That, <laughs> you kind of play that Barry Sheen style, that kind of bit of a jester always or sort of winding up Hodgson on the grid or wherever it might yeah. be, you know, at every, every opportunity. Yeah. I mean, is that your way of sort of dissipating the tension of, of, of racing? Is that your way of, of handling it at the point of um, release, if you like? Don't worry, Keith. I can give you some stick. Do not worry. If you really want me to lay into you, I can lay into you. No, but um, obviously on the grid, I like to have fun. I like to, Around the paddock, I joke around. I joke with my team. Um, and, yeah, I just enjoy it. I want to give the fans something something different and something to laugh about and and be like, uh, well, that, that's a different aspect to, to what normal people do on the grid. And I like to give that side of things. And that is me. I like to mess about. And when I need to be serious, I can be serious. So... I like to turn it on when I need to, and I like to be serious me when I need to. So you've got showtime, and then you've got normal me. Well, you're growing up. You've grown a beard now as well. Hey, I'm trying, trying. Well, welcome <laughs> to the club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only cool Kids people today. Have beards, Kids today. <laughs> Pete. Okay, yes. Uh, just following up, Jake, on what he's saying there, I mean, such a tight class moto too i mean could you take us through some of the sort of the keys to success and what sort of separates the you know getting on the podium and being in that big pack of mid-group riders what are the things you, you've got to really focus on during the race weekends to be up there yeah um that's a good one um it's a number of things obviously one you need to have a good qualifying <laughs> even though i say that in philip island i started 14th and still come through to the podium so Yes. Look, if you've got a good race pace, you're going to be there or thereabouts. And the one thing that I seem to have struggled with that I need to improve for the, this year is the, the first six to seven laps of the race. I can't seem to get going in them. I don't feel comfortable at the beginning and I don't seem to have the grip that the others seem to have around me. 
for whatever the reason that is, I don't know. And this is something that we need to work on throughout testing. But from that point onwards, um, if not the fastest guy on track, but I've given myself so much work to come back through is super difficult because everyone's so close. So to take half a second now of the best in the world is difficult and you have to go over the limit at times. But this year, it's just been a matter of being having a good bike, one, having a great team, two, and um, believing in what I can do and my abilities because I've not got any faster from day one that I entered the World Championship. I've just learned to, to manage myself, manage my expectations, and take it lap by lap, corner by corner, and try not to rush too much. I think they're the biggest things. Uh, you, you mentioned the Yamaha rides earlier. I mean, one of the things that, that Motosu doesn't have is traction control. Of course, you didn't have that in BSB either, but I just, where do you stand on that? Do you think it would be a, a help for guys moving up to MotoGP or would it cause sort of more problems than it might fix? <sighs> Do you know what? The traction control in MotoGP is so good, you don't even know you've got traction control. That, that's the, the crazy thing about it. All you feel is you're just getting less power. So, like in World Superbikes, you can almost hear the traction cutting. On the MotoGP bike, you can never hear the traction cutting when you're even on board with them. So, it's a real tricky thing. I think it does help, but it's also you have to have the, the belief in the system's going to work. So, yeah, there, there's so many different things that from MotoGP to Moto2 are so different. But then uh, I think Moto2 teaches you so many different things in to have good throttle control, to be smooth, to pick the bike up. So there's many things that you still that they are in the same aspects of riding MotoGP bike. Um, yeah, it's, they're, they're, there's things that are correct, like exactly the same and then things that are so different. So... Yeah, I I enjoyed it. That is the, a good thing. And I feel better on more horsepower generally than I do on a Moto2 bike. But yeah, I think it will help to your answer to that <laughs> when you step up. <laughs> Bit of a hot topic at the moment. Not doesn't directly affect you, but it's come up in all the team launches, of course, these sprint races that are coming in in MotoGP. I mean... Yeah. If you were to be involved in them, let's say in in a few years, or what, what's your opinion on sprint races generally? Do you think it's a good idea? I love to it. Reshuffle in the race weekend, I love it. all that yeah, as well. Yeah. I think uh, it's great. I think it's great for the fans. It's great for it's great for everyone. It's great for sponsors. More TV time you can get, and ultimately we go for racing, so it's more more racing to do. I'm sick to death of riding around for forty minutes in a session, setting your bike. I'm ready to go the minute I do my lap one on fp1 i can go and race uh this, especially this year with the bike that they gave me or last year the bike they gave me was so good i was able to roll out and be quick straight away so as you probably seen most of the fridays i was friday man me i was p1 every friday so <laughs> for me it makes no difference i think it would be great i would love it because it means probably less sessions for setting up your bike um and more racing and i love racing as all of you seen in uh, Malaysia, I like a bit of a uh, elbow, <laughs> elbow bashing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Um, well, we've got loads of um, listener questions uh, that have come yep. in, so I've had to narrow some down. Um, so, thank you for sending them all in. Uh, my bike bits has asked uh, if you could only choose one bike for the road for all uses. What's it going to be? I'll fucking use one bike for the road. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Um, one bike. I probably tricky, have some. Uh, yeah, it's I would probably have. Do you keep up on. with road bikes? Do you keep up with road bikes and things like that? Because I always remember most racers yeah. don't know really what's going on on the well, road. The, the thing is, I haven't got a bike license, so it, it's super difficult. Do you know what I really like the look of? I like the look of them, like cafe racer sort of like i probably would have something like a cafe racer like harley davidson type of bike that has got flat bars and you don't drive ride too far you have like a, a piss pot helmet on and <laughs> you look cool as yeah. the rage in mine on your dad's day <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keith, Keith, that was what you used to wear as you was racing you're that old. I, I still cut me hair around it <laughs> <laughs> You had the goggles on with it, didn't you? You didn't have a visor. You had the goggles. <laughs> In my day, mate, oh. you didn't even need a helmet. 
Right. Uh, next one. Adam Keeble says, any plans to follow in your dad's footsteps and try some sidecar racing? Okay. <laughs> no. Shut that down. No. Shut straight down. no. no. Straight no. Completely right. Good. Not. No, we like we like quick answers. Um, okay. Underrated has asked, uh, do you think you'll have more chance of moving up to MotoGP uh, with Gas Gas pr- uh, branded machinery? Ooh. Well, for mm. one, that's not a very underrated question for mm. his underrated. <laughs> and um, look, I don't know. I don't know. All I am thinking of right this second is my dreams and ambitions to be world champion this year. And if I do that, it'll open up many doors, not just yeah. one door. So I think I just focus on myself, focus on race by race and... Yeah, if I do that, I think the world's my oyster. Nice. Now, the next couple aren't actually questions, but I thought I'd, I'd put them to you. Uh, David Hall says, my little girl is a big fan, just turned three. She stands in front of the TV uh, or track side shouting, stay on the bike, Jake. Please, can you give her a shout out? Her name's Aurora. 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 Right. I'm hoping this year that I will definitely be staying on the bike and giving you something to shout about other than crashing. So, yeah, <laughs> there you go, Aurora. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, she'll love that. And uh, Mark Heinrich also said, thanks, Jake, for coming to chat with the Marshals at Phillip Island last year. Uh, so nice of him to do so and for us to get to know him a bit better. So uh, very nice of you there. Now, I've got a couple of quick fire questions to sort of round things off. Um we obviously know you've got some pretty decent talent uh, on a bike, but do you have any hidden talents that we might not know about? Oh, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> All I can say to that, Jake, is it's well hidden. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to um, be. I've asked that question to so many people. That's the best answer. I've to say. Jake Nixon, half man, half mattress. <laughs> 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 can we put I that actually, up <laughs> i actually don't have any um <sighs> hidden, i don't think i have any hidden talent no, are you are you are you a good cook or a singer or you know or you anything are, like that? if you if you ask sarah i don't cook no. I, I don't do the washing no <laughs> I'm, I'm useless other than just, yeah riding the, the other, motorbike the other I'm thing useless. yeah yeah <laughs> right okay well in that vein though do you have like a go-to cheat meal if you can't be asked to to, you know to keep up the diet and all that do you have a go-to cheat meal yeah um um i like this place right it's in especially here if i'm here at the minute in barcelona there's a place it's called vegan junk food and obviously being vegan um things are coming a lot better for us but it's like the best vegan burgers nachos everything you can think of place like literally if you're ever in barcelona go to a place called vegan junk food it is the absolute bomb i'm telling you now it will not disappoint anyone out there anyone that listens i should be an ambassador i should be an ambassador for vegan junk they should be on your bike jesus yeah exactly (laughs) you'll see next week vegan junk food on my helmet no um, honestly Super, super nice. I love it. Um, and it probably a burger would be my go to that, that I would have. Okay, nice. Uh, and final quick fire one from me. Obviously, your career is in motorcycle racing, but if that wasn't possible, what would you have done? What would you be doing? Um, porn star, no, ah. no. <laughs> not with that <laughs> hidden talent. No. <laughs> <laughs> i don't think sarah would be too happy about that either um, oh, you wouldn't get this on bt would you <laughs> no definitely not <laughs> no um what would that be uh i quite like car racing i've got a car simulator at home and i really like car racing and probably once i've once i feel once i've done the bike side of things um all being well i would like to have a go for a couple of years in like a i don't know a touring car or something like that i think okay. I would, let, let I me let me stop you there you have just made harry's day yeah that's that yeah. just my i'm, I'm a four wheeler who's come over to two wheels so <laughs> I like, listen i am the biggest f1 fan you'll ever come across no way! I, watch, <laughs> I watch every free practice session i could tell you what's going on session by session also i when I, um, basically a couple of years ago, when I rode for Patronus, Patronus 
wanted me to do an esports race for them on the Formula One simulator. And I was practicing. I was going down to Brackley and practicing with um, on the Sims with George Russell. No and way. I had um, James Val as my engineer, and I've still got his number now. And we still text, and he still helps me with certain things. Well, he's just, he's just become the boss of Williams, so you might be in luck in a couple of years' time. Yeah, yeah, he's Has just he he's, really? the, he's the team principal now. So, oh, yeah. bloody hell. Yeah. Bloody hell. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They keep, so keep his number. Yeah. I'm, I'm like Williams, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Dixon to Williams. You heard it here first. Exactly. <laughs> well, look, Jake, it is, you know, it's always a pleasure to, to hear what you have to say. Uh, we're really looking forward to, to watching you and see how you get on this year. We're all backing you, that's for sure. Um, thanks to everybody sending questions as well. Um, Jake, any final words? I'm, I'm, I'm literally surprised. 20 minutes. Blue by. We have, well, to be fair, we've got, we've got four gone. minutes. If anybody else has a final question they want to throw in, we have four minutes. Keith, oh. wait, Keith always likes to talk, so. <laughs> final question. We've always got final questions. Uh, let's let's look forward to, to 2023, shall we? I mean, like, you know, last year, so many podiums, so much yeah. success. One tiny step further forward in what is the most competitive year that's likely to be. I mean, where do you see next year? Where's, where's your first win coming? Which track? Could be the first race. Portugal, I really like it. Um, Obviously crashed out of the lead in Portugal. Um, No, I think, listen, I think if if I play my cards right, if I work hard throughout every weekend, there isn't a track that I can't win at. So I believe in myself, I back myself. I believe 23 is going to be my year. And, um, I hope for everyone that watches me, supports me, I can put on a good show. We love to hear Brilliant. it. We love Brilliant. it. Yeah. And Keith, <laughs> suck it. <laughs> Mate, I'll run around my garden with nothing on when you win your first race. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mate, uh, hopefully the, the neighbours won't want to be seeing that, mate. That shriveled, <laughs> that shriveled up thing. I'll tell you what, in this weather, they won't be seeing it. <laughs> Oh I, I, oh, I knew this interview would go one way, but well, I yeah. uh, <laughs> didn't know, didn't know it would end like that. Um, Jake, I think we'll leave it there. Um, okay. so, yeah, Jake, thank you so much for coming on the Crash Moto GP podcast. We'll have oh, to get you back on later on in the year. Best of luck though for, for the start of the season um, and, uh, and good luck as well. Yeah, good luck. No, pleasure. And uh, I hope you all have a great year. And yeah, I'm sure I'll be speaking to you very soon. Cheers, Jake. All the best. I mean, Keith, it was brilliant to catch up with Jake last week, wasn't it? He's such a character. He's always on good form. He is always on good form. Although I have to say, he seemed just a just a little bit polite and a little bit reticent with us, which was which was quite interesting. I mean, he was he was you know those Zoom calls are always a bit um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sterilized, aren't they? They're always a they're a little sterile when you sat in front of your monitor. There, it's not like having the Jack the Lad banter yeah. where you're pushing and shoving and drinking pints of beer. So um, he, he's, he's always the funniest guy on the in the paddock. There's no doubt about that. You can see why he gets on so well with so many people, journalists and riders alike. Um, in fact, I mean it's quite interesting that the, the Quattararo link between Jake and himself is is very close they seem to be really good mates and I, I i see this week as well that quattararo has been out with the american racing team with another one of the brits of course of the scotsman uh, rory skinner uh, they've been turning some laps over in california and it's been interesting that quattararo is out there should we say fraternizing with them as well john hopkins has had a, another hip operation he's been beaten to a to a pulp over the years he's a, and he was in his leathers as well so that must have been a real good fun time is it me, Pete, or does it seem like everyone's having really good times in their social lives nowadays? It doesn't seem quite as, um, what's the words I'm looking for? Quite as, I was going to say the B word, but I can't say it nowadays. So not, it seems quite friendly, doesn't it, nowadays? Uh, whereas in the past, everyone was sort of on each other's back and sniping from afar. It just seems like a nicer place to be in MotoGP nowadays. And Keith doesn't like that. <laughs> well, yes. To start with, I've had to moderate my language hugely from the 1980s. Uh, my entire thinking has is, is, is gone <clears throat> completely. Um, it's quite, that's another thing. That's a whole new podcast subject, that is, how all of us have had to temper our, um, our thoughts, our public thoughts. And a lot of things that, are, that, that, that get the box ticked nowadays um, 
is just pushed underground a little bit. You know, it doesn't stop people thinking the way they think. They still have that, but they're not allowed to articulate that quite as um, loudly as they perhaps would have done in the past. And if they do, then they're 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 cancelled forever by the uh, woke brigade, which is a whole new um, fraternity for as far as I'm concerned. Obviously, I I haven't joined that clan, um, and uh, I'm I'm not I'm not harping for a membership in it either. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pete, what do you have to say? <laughs> I mean, is it this long off-season, though? Is that one of the reasons why things are so friendly? As Keith's saying, you know, the, the riders, they, you know, everyone, like everyone in the paddock, they're so sick of each other after a full racing season. But then, you know, once they're apart for a bit, they actually start to miss each other, don't they? And, uh, you know, it has been a long time, start of November, since uh, the MotoGP bikes were on track. So, I don't know. I think people are... Uh, yeah, they, they, now's about time to start again. So, uh, yeah. Week to go. Well, you can see how bored they must be because they've all been running road, road bikes everywhere. Because of the testing you know, situation, the rules regarding that, everyone's been out on 600s or, or, or whatever it might be, turning turning miles. Because at the end of the day, these guys, it's not just a job. It's an absolutely fanatical, you know, favourite hobby as well. It's, it's something that these guys, is, you know, burnt in, not riding around on a motorbike, not going faster than the next man, whatever it might be that you're riding. Um, they all want to be out there turning miles. Uh, and and they have been this this winter. So maybe the uh, testing rules, testing ban, and the like over the the winter, people are find, finding a way around that of of keeping sharp. Interesting as well. We're getting lots of stuff out from the Marquez camp. You know, Marquez, how much training he puts in. You know, we all know these guys train, but I don't think anybody realizes just how hard they train, how hard they work. You don't see that very often. You know, back in the day. Yeah, the Kevin Schwanzes of the world that never did anything except they were bike fit. They were always on a bike. You know, they don't get that opportunity anymore. There's not them hundreds and hundreds of miles of testing like there used to be. Um, so bike fit is something that you've got to try and replicate in a gym if you can. Uh, Mick Doohan was the was the maniac when it came to being fit. I mean, he was just ridiculously fit, even after he busted his leg so badly. You know, Mick still trained like mad. That's more modern day. Um, and when you see what Marquez is going through at the moment to try and get himself to peak fitness, because he ain't getting any younger now, now, Marquez, you know. <laughs> now, have you seen that scar as well? Like, I, it's on his arm. It's just, I mean, obviously we know the, the veracity of it, but every time you see it, you just go, God, the work that went on there. And then to still drive a motorbike at the speeds he was doing, even when it wasn't fixed, you just go, you're on another planet, mate, aren't you? Look at you. Look at that scar. Look at that scar. <laughs> scar anyway, worshipping. Scar Harry, worshipping. Harry Benjamin. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, well, there's clearly uh, everyone's having a good time off the track for now. We'll see if that uh, friendly behaviour continues uh, on the track when we get there. Um, but there's already been a bit of a, a bit of a bust up in the world of uh, superbike racing, I suppose we can say. And uh, if you haven't seen this, well, it involves Anna Carrasco and Alvaro Bautista, uh, a testing session going on, which contained both. And I've got I've got the tweet here. I might just read it out so it gives people a bit of um, a bit of context. Uh, and this was apparently uh, this is what Anna Carrasco tweeted, right? Taking part in the same testing session as, as Alvaro Bautista. And, and uh, this was from Bautista. In the early afternoon, the Spaniard had a moment of shock in the first corner. He said, I had Anna Carrasco about half a straight length in front of me, but in the braking zone, I got closer to her much too quickly. I had to right the bike, came onto the dirty outside of the corner, and the front wheel slipped off. Nothing happened. Anna should ride with the amateurs. At the moment, she is way too slow to ride with the superbike and the super sport guys. It's not very safe. And Anna then response to that said, you say amateur because I'm a woman, world champion. I saw your board at the finish line and I knew you were coming between T1 and T2. I got inside. I turned to see when you were passing and I saw you falling. So don't count. I'm not sure what that word is, but I probably can't read it out. Uh, so <laughs> so that's lost in translation, that one. Uh, so, I mean, what do we make of that? Obviously, Anna Carrasco is the 2018 world champion of SSP 300. So... <sighs> Well, you, no, it's what, quite easy to answer, really. Um, there's a disparity in motorbikes out there. Forget about the amateur or the or the disparity in talent. Um, Alvaro Batista is a MotoGP rider at the end of the day, and a good one. And he's been he's been through the ranks. He, he's approaching a slower motorbike. He ought to know bloody better to start with. B, uh, from me, there shouldn't be motorbikes out on the track that have a disparity in performance. Um, forget about the riders. It's a bit like, you know, I mean, Alvaro speaking as if it's a track day where you have a 
fast group, slow group, and an intermediate group. Um, that ain't the case. It's a test. Everyone's out there testing. You come across people that aren't as fast as you, talent-wise, and are on motorbikes that aren't as fast as your motorbike. And it sounds to me like Alvaro got himself tangled up. Where this non-story has become such a big thing is because they both blasted off in public, which they never should have done. Anna Carrasco is a world champion. You can argue that the Supersport 300 class is not quite, um, should we say, MotoGP standard, World Superbike standard, uh, but it is a world championship that a woman won for the first time ever. So therefore, she deserves a little bit more respect than perhaps um, being called an amateur. That I will say straight away. Um, I, I think it's a 70-30 thing, isn't it? Alvaro, 70% in the wrong for me. You know, he's approaching a slower bike. He already said that it was half a, half a straight in, in front of him. He could see it. He knows what the rate of close is. You know, she may have not been on the right part of the track. She might have been sort of going out on an outlap, perhaps, or intending on coming in on the inlap. That's, it's a test at the end of the day. It's not a race. So you can't criticise people in a test. It's as much your responsibility to see what's going on around you as it is theirs. So I think Alvaro blasted off when he shouldn't have done. Um, but, like I said... For me, you shouldn't have motorbikes out on a racetrack that have got a major disparity. That is that is the underlying thing for me. You know, if you're going to have a test session, you split it up into half-hour sessions. Fast bikes are out there, as in you know, big bikes, world superbikes. Anything under that goes out in another session. Sorts it all out. Shouldn't shouldn't be put a risk like that. But Alvaro should have kept his mouth shut. And um, like I say, for me, seventy percent his fault, thirty percent hers. I think that's exactly it, Keith, isn't it? That, you know, imagine if it was MotoGP bikes testing with with Moto2 or Moto3 on, on at the same time. You're going to get incidents like this, aren't you? Just You know it's going to happen at some stage. And I'm guessing with Anna's bike, it wouldn't have been on full slick tyres and everything because of the testing rules and everything else. So it would have been a super sport bike and then sort of a road sort of production type thing, as Keith was mentioning, the MotoGP guys train with because of the testing rules. They're not allowed to test, obviously, with MotoGP bikes. They're not even allowed to test with souped up super bikes, if you like. Quattararo got in trouble a few years ago. He, he tested an R1 that they decided was a bit too heavily modified. He hadn't actually done anything wrong technically other than not get permission to do it, if you like, beforehand uh, because the electronics weren't standard or something. that I mean, he didn't know. He just got on it and did a, did a day of riding. I think this is 2020 before the delayed COVID season. But there's all these things that stop them testing with bikes that are too close to Grand Prix bikes. Um, but I think, yeah, you know, Jerez, narrow track, you know, not easy to pass anyway. And then you put guys, people out there. I don't know what the lap time difference would have been. 10 seconds a lap. I mean, that, that's an age, isn't it? Between, between different, different bikes. So you're going to get incidents like this eventually. Um, but as you say, then you start firing off tweets and, 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 and it's, it sort of went beyond that, didn't it? It went, it, it went Tom Sykes and, and Scott Redding have now also sort of got involved as well. So it, yeah, this, this, this one moment has sort of blown up. Well, the inflammatory is always the problem, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't speak Spanish or, or any other language. Only Essex, to be honest. Essex and foul. <laughs> and even that's a bit. Yeah. My languages. <laughs> but the problem is, is that quite often with these things that are sent out in maybe Spanish or any other language, sometimes the interpretation is slightly different. There are certain certain words I know in English that if you said them in, in, in another language, they would be insulting. Whereas here, it's almost you know a matey banter. So there are some things that can be misconstrued with that. But as I said before, Alvaro Bautista is, is a is a full-time top-line professional and he should have known better. And it also gets everybody on board, you know, everybody shouting and screaming from the rooftops about misogyny, which is something that, you know, I don't see such a lot of what people say there is in the paddock regarding uh, any misogyny towards girls, women, and, and being, you know, as, I, as I've said many, many times, I must be what bore you, but the, the dad of four four girls, um, I am, you know, always constantly monitoring that kind of thing. If anybody, you know, whatever anybody says, I'm, I'm alert to it. And all it does is gives a platform for everybody to say, well, he said it because he's, she's a girl and all the rest of it. You know, Anna's had a hard time to get to where she is. There is no doubt about that. She's probably had to work twice as hard in her head to overcome the kind of bias that there is out there, you know, I don't, I don't think it's prevalent. You know, some people say that the paddock is, is a misogynistic kind of place and breeds it, but I don't believe that. I don't see that from on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Um, but then you get something like this that really kind of underlines that whole political narrative again, doesn't it? And and I think that that really, you know, Bautista's responsibility was not to sort of to promote that side of things. It, it looks bad. And I, I think that he would have done well to have just sort of thought about that before he opened his gob, let alone put it out on on social media. Not a good idea, Alvaro. No, and, and everyone on Twitter sort of picked that up as well. Someone said, um, I don't know what will have happened here, uh, but if the super sports share the track, as you were saying, with, with super bikes, these things can happen because among the super sport, Anna Carrasco had rolled in a 148. David Munoz was in the 147s. Uh, somebody else was in the 146s. So I think it was just a bit of a, a, a disaster waiting to happen, really. And uh, But but then the, the the backlash on top of that, the social media aggravation, it highlights the kind of world we're living in now where, as you said right at the, the, the start of the show, Keith, like these things, you've got to kind of temper what you say. You've got to be so careful when you put a tweet out. It's the modern world. I mean, it's the modern world. I mean, I'm 66 years old. I have, I have got to work within that modern world under the modern world rules. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that you have got to... You've still got to put your point across. You've still got to, you know, don't sit on a fence. Still put your point across, but you've got to use language that is in the modern modern times. You know, you can get close, sail close to the wind. I think I probably do quite often. You know, and the point being is is that without sort of homogenizing your your opinions or your 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 personality, and that's the trick. I mean, you imagine what it's like. Well, why am I saying you imagine what it's like, Harry? You're a broadcaster. You know exactly what it's like. You know, when you are verbalizing everything pete writes stuff down he gets a second chance just to read it through before he presses the ping <laughs> button whereas when when we're in in commentary or or worse still you know you can see us um it comes out your mouth and you think oh shit have i got that close to it yeah. you know jeremy clarkson i mean Oof. yeah there you go jeremy clarkson did you watch that thing about clarkson the other night i had to watch it just to see how, what, how they stitched oh no up. no i didn't I mean, well, there was a whole program on 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 his gaffes and bits and pieces. Oh, right. It was a, a typical fluffy thing in the end. It wasn't really anything that was hard hitting. But the fact is, the bloke, the bloke is an old knob. You know, it, you you just can't you know stand there in your tweed jacket and say some of the things you say. He gets away with it, but does he get away with it? I mean, anybody under thirty will think, oh God's sake, have we got to put up with these blokes. When's he going to die? You know, it's it's kind of. It is. I mean, the kids that are coming through school now, this is a rant of mine again, isn't it? I always get on that soapbox. But the kids, <laughs> my kids, your kids, Ari, eventually, will be the leaders of the country. How they are coming up. They are tomorrow's leaders, policy makers, thinkers, teachers. They are going to be the ones that are <laughs> ruling the country, the world. So we got to start taking a bit of notice. <laughs> look up, wise, look wise over our words. shoulders a bit. Yeah. <laughs> wise words from uh, Mr. Hewan. Um, just, just returning to the to the Bautista thing. I mean, I, I haven't seen the tweet, whether it was in Spanish or whatever else. I think the question you also got to ask yourself is: Would he have said exactly the same thing to a to a male rider? Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, we can all think of plenty of examples where a MotoGP rider has come upon a slower rider, something's happened, and they've gone off the track, and that's a MotoGP rider against another MotoGP rider. So. Whoever this was that Bautista tripped over on track, I think the chances are he would have had a, a bit of a moan at them because that's what riders do. It's never their fault. I don't know if you ever see. I, I did. Uh, uh, I put a, an interview with Hervé Poncherel uh, up about talking about Ica Lacona, and um, it's actually in the story, but it was part of the interview as well. He was just sort of saying how generally riders. You know, they, they 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 fall off and they say it was we did exactly the same as the lap before. Yeah. You know, and, and it's never it's never their fault. But uh, it's kind of like that in this situation, isn't it? You know, he's probably a bit embarrassed as well that he has run off the track and and, and fallen over when, as Key says, he didn't need to. He should have mm. avoided it. But that's what happens. A rider falls off and they, and they let rip on social media, don't they? And would he would he have done anything different if it had been a male rider? I, I don't know because I don't know what he said. But there we are. I think I think that's also worth thinking about. Totally. I think Alvaro would have said it, whether it was a male rider or a female rider. I actually don't think there was any misogyny in there at all. I think he would have blasted off. I mean, look at the time he had to go at Johnny Johnny Ray. Um, you know, if it had been Munoz who was doing similar times to Anna, he'd have got the same broadside. It just wouldn't have got blown up quite so big in social media because of it. But um, like I said right at the beginning, it's, it's something and nothing. He should have been paying more attention. If she was a slower rider, he knew there was a slower rider in front, you know, yeah. You ram someone up the back or, or nearly ram someone up the back, 
it's your fault really isn't it exactly that's what the insurance will say um well before we move on uh at least it's the end of january now so we're into february things starting to look a little bit better uh but how do you fancy uh having some more things to look forward to in 2023 and planning your escape with Brittany ferries whether you're a seasoned traveler or want to experience places like uh, france and spain for the first time Brittany ferries is the way forward with space to relax and unwind in comfort vibrant and historical cities breathtaking countryside beautiful beaches and so much more are all waiting for you and there is even more of a reason to get booking straight away as Brittany ferries have a limited time offer you can book a flexi ticket for the same price as a standard ticket amendable until up to four hours before your outward sailing and with a low deposit their flexi ticket means you can book with confidence with the added security that your plans can change as and when you need them to the offer ends on the 28th of february 2023 and for more information simply head to brittanyferries.com forward slash bikers so what are you waiting for? But today, an experience, a richer way to travel with Brittany Ferries. And thank you very much to them for letting us do our podcasting. Uh, now, Anna Carrasco, done. Finish that chat, even though a bit of, we managed we managed to make that last for quite a while, even though we're all saying it's just something out of nothing, really, isn't it? And then, and then let's move on, because it's been a busy-ish week. We've had some more launches, although much like uh, when the last one we did, what was Yamaha, it was it's a bit more of a livery launch. But there's... Some news coming out of that, you know, KTM has said Danny Pedros is going to do a, a wild card appearance this year. But we've also got a bit of chat about the Aprilia situation, haven't we, Keith, for, for 2023 and, and what they're facing this year? Yeah, I mean, I mean it was a, a crash um, article that Pete wrote that uh, he couldn't remember he wrote when we spoke to him before. <laughs> it was quite funny. And it came out of the KTM um, press situation. Maybe they've not got much to talk about. So um, Danny Pedrosa gets pushed to the front to... Uh, uh, to give them uh, some mileage when it comes to press and uh, media. But the big thing is really what Pete wrote, and I, you, you need to, to really find the link and uh, and get onto Pete's article, but uh, basically Aprilia, unlike Suzuki uh, particularly, um, when they lose their concessions, the next year is a tough year. Suddenly you haven't got the extra motors, the extra opportunity to change things through, throughout the year. And that makes a big difference to to the development of a motorbike. Um, you can't get it all done in one year, really. They've got to go forward when it comes to the next year. But where Aprilia score, pretty much, is that they've got two really good riders now in a satellite team. So there's four bikes. So we've doubled the data. So they've given themselves half a chance, even though they've lost the concessions. Good article, though, Pete, because I'd forgotten all about it. The, the, you know, Making the, the, the link between how teams that lost concessions did in their next year when they had no concessions, the first time they had no concessions. Um, and nobody really has shone, have they, in their uh, their first no, year? No, and I was slightly surprised by that, to be honest, Keith. When I looked it up, I was, I was, you know, I thought, oh, yeah, let's, let's just have a look. Uh, the, the Suzuki obviously fared the worst in that they actually dropped back into concessions after one year. So so that'll be obviously something a pretty will, will be out to avoid. So you Only can two bikes, though. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, as you say, Keith, the big difference here with Aprilia is that they're going, they're doubling the number of bikes. With the other two teams, they were keeping the same numbers. So uh, Suzuki 2-2 and KTM 4-4. So, so that didn't really change for them. So it'll be interesting to see what impact that extra data has uh, compared to the others that have done it. But the, the big thing, well, as Keith says, engine changes, you've got to get the engine right. There's only going to be two tests basically with your race riders, only five days, Sepang three, Portimao only two. So you've got five days with your race riders before you seal your engine for the entire year. Don't want to get that wrong. That's what happened with Suzuki. They were stuck with it the whole year, couldn't even get one podium that year. So that, that's why they dropped back into concessions. Uh, the other thing is you lose testing with your race riders. And that's the big thing you were t- talking about KTM, the launch and Danny Pedrosa. That's the big thing that they've sort of been trying to deal with is how you shift development away from the race team on race weekends, if you like, and in private tests. The private tests are now gone, so it's got to be done by your test team. And in a really good, you know, the parts have to be really closely targeted. You know what they're going to do. You're pretty 99% confident they're going to work before you dare give them to the team. And they gave Brad Binder a, a chassis at um, Valencia, and, and that was it, one for the year, and it worked. It, you know, they were they were sure it was going to work, and it did offer improvements. Now, uh, Pit Byer was saying in previous years, they'd done six or seven chassis during a season. So that just shows how things change. Obviously, the nearer you get to the top, 
smaller little gaps, the harder it is. But that's that transition that KTM are trying to make this year. Um, as, as they try and move from race winners, they won seven races, but they haven't fought for the championship yet. And that's got that's the next step they need to take. The other thing is, of course, we've got we've spoken about it quite a lot. We've got sprint races on Saturday now. So you basically you've got two different setups. It's, you know, you've got one that can use all of the tire on a, on a Saturday and another bike that might be set up slightly different to, to, to give you a tire that's going to last you to the end of things. And we've got tire monitors this year that are absolutely going to be accurate. So therefore, you're not going to have that that opportunity to perhaps duck below the uh, minimum tire pressure that you there was a fair amount of uh, what should we say flexibility in in how that's been run up to now so there, there are a lot of things that are changing this year that are going to make a massive difference and a massive workload you know to, to to have a sprint race on a saturday with a motorbike that can be set completely differently to the one on a sunday depending on tire tire usage and the like obviously you know we've had some races in the past where it's been a, a line of stern affair while they all keep their tires in for the last few laps of the race you know we'll have none of that on a saturday anymore so it's gonna be a bloody tough year for technicians this year anybody who's managed to poach the best men out of suzuki this year are really going to put them put them to good use you know now that suzuki is disbanded um those good guys that they had there and there were some really good guys in suzuki they are going to be so useful for the teams that have managed to, to get their services Jack Miller was actually saying about the sprints. He said, "Look, some people are going to prefer them to the to the Sunday races, aren't they? You know, those are that's going to be the race that we remember." Now, I asked Pit Byer, as I as I've mentioned on here loads of times, you know, but what about the fact that it's not a real Grand Prix win? You know, the Saturday, and he said, "That's fine with me. I think the you know." So again, he's another one that everyone I've asked that disagrees with me, but anyway, he's fine with it that the Sunday is the main win, and that's it. Um, but as Jack says, you know, the Saturday ones could be the ones that we remember when we look back over the season, uh, because and they're going to mention the points. They could make the difference. They could be a title decider, maybe if things play out in a particular kind of way. Uh, I'm I'm very excited to uh, if come back to Aprilia to see what they can do. I think having the satellite team as well with two very strong riders will, will might might well make a, a crucial difference actually in, in how their year goes. Um, and we all want Alessia Spargo to be back up there, don't we, for another year. So uh, and Maverick as well. Um, right, we're coming towards the end. You're getting splinters, Ari. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm on that fence. <clears throat> I wouldn't be sitting on the fence if Ika Laquona was still in MotoGP. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Ika. Uh, right. Uh, we're getting towards the end. But um, you have been sending in your questions, your voice noted questions at our email. It's podcast at crash.net. If you uh, want to send any kind of question, record a little voice note on your phone. Chuck it over uh, on the email, and uh, if it's good enough, we'll, um, of course it's good enough, but if we have time, we'll play it out. And we've got time, so I thought we might end with some listener questions. And our first one is from Julio. Take a listen to this. Hello to everyone at the Crash Moto GP podcast. This is Julio from the Philippines. I'm a big fan. So my question is, do you think we are seeing the death of the inline four engine? Obviously, with Suzuki pulling out, of MotoGP. The only inline four we're seeing right now is from Yamaha. And we all know that Yamaha is having engine trouble. Every other team is rocking V4s. So yeah, what do you think? Are we seeing the death of the inline four? And do you think Yamaha will be able to keep up? Cheers, bye. Julio, this year is gonna tell because it's all about this year. If Yamaha can't make it work this year, I mean, the inline four, what a beautiful motorbike to ride it has been, but you're right, you know, that might not be the configuration of the future. Um, we'll see how it goes this year, I think. As Keith says, I mean, Yamaha, a big effort this year. Luca Marmarini's coming in, isn't he? The Formula One guy to kind of boost the power on it. We know that the Suzuki, that Suzuki got decent power from that engine. You know, that, so, you know, it can be done. But, uh, you know, when you're in a, in a championship where you've got single tyre supplier, when you're doing something a bit different, whether it's KTM with the chassis and the suspension or it's Yamaha with the engine, there's always that danger that you kind of get outvoted, isn't there, in terms of technical things and, and because the, you've got to go with the majority. And, uh, you know, it's but it could all change in an instant. If, if uh, Michelin come out with a revised front tire or a rear tire that happens to suit better the characteristics of the inline four, suddenly it, it all swings back again. So it's a tricky one. But this year will tell because... They can't, Quattro's patience isn't going to last forever, is it? You know, he's been waiting for some decent engine performance now for several seasons. Now, as Keith says, we're going to see, 
can they deliver it with this current configuration? And if not, will they have to change it? And let's not forget, in 2027, the everything is up for grabs as far as the technical rules. You know, there will be uh, the next five-year contract between the factories and Dorna. And so that's normally when, if you're going to change something, that's when it will be. And that will have to be agreed probably this year. If there's going to be a big change to the engine rules, a change in the size, things like that, um, the KTM launch pit buyer made clear, look, we don't think hybrid engines or, or anything with batteries has a place in Grand Prix racing or indeed in full-size motorcycles. So he's putting his, uh, you know, mark in, the, mark in the sand, if you like, and making clear they don't want to see any, any fundamental change to the engines in that sense. We know they're going to these uh, sustainable fuels, but could there be a change in capacity? If it went, we had 800 cc before, of course. If it, if if something like that changed, might that then give Yap give Yamaha and the inline four just give them a chance again more? Who knows? But I mean, that engine has done what I don't know. I think it's too early to write it off, but I think it's always a temptation when you've got something different and you're looking over at the other manufacturers on their V4s. It, it's a tough one for the riders if they if they're seeing these bikes go by them on the straight. So big year for the. Big year for the inline four, I think, is exactly as Keith says. Big year yeah, for the inline four. But again, with Julio, sorry, Harry, to get back on, across you there. I mean, Julio's point, it's all very well saying, well, we're going to see the last of the inline fours, or are we going to see the last of Yamaha in MotoGP? You know, stretch it one bit further. Suzuki dropped the ball, you know, straight away. They are obviously, they're manufacturing, they're looking towards electric bikes and so on and so forth. You know, you don't know what's going to happen politically within the board at Yamaha. Maybe they'll have a massive change. Maybe they'll they'll think it's time to change completely. So in line four, it might even be a factory that drops out. You never know. It's volatile. There's a lot riding on it, I think there's it, a it? big indicator on the future will be this rumoured satellite deal, won't it? Mm. it? Let's see if that gets done. If, if that gets done, I think that we can, you know, that will ease those sort of rumours because no factory is going to sign up to a multi-year deal with a satellite team if they are going to pull out. So, yeah, let's wait and see on that. Again, no deal done yet. There's only two Yamahas, as Keith says, on the grid. But, you know, they they keep making the right noises about looking for a satellite team. Let's see if they do the deal. Will it be Rossi's team? It's a make or break year for the inline four, Julio. Thanks for your question. Uh, let's go good to... a uh, Very good question. Uh, let's go to Dean next, who has this. Hi, Keith and the team. Uh, my question, probably the same question as many people are asking. Um, do you think Mark Marquez will jump from Honda to Ducati? Um, and if so, would it be mid-season? Would he jump out of contracts? Is he able to jump jump out of contracts? Or would it be sort of 2024 before he goes to Ducati if he does go at all? And also, the second question, actually part of that one, part B, if you like, is do you think that Honda will be able to pull something out of the bag to be up the sharp end with the rest of the Ducatis on the grid? I like these voice questions. They're brilliant. They're great, right? <laughs> They're really, really good. Um, he won't jump ship halfway through the year, that's for sure. But yeah, we've mentioned Quattararo being unhappy with what Yamaha have uh, produced. We'll see what Honda have produced for um, for the likes of Mark Marquez. But can I see him jump into Ducati? Well, he had opportunities before. I don't know. I think he should. I hope he does. I think a change of manufacturer will be, you know, the way to go. I mean, it used to be done in the olden days. You'd, you'd always get people that would making world championships work for them on, on on different manufacturers. So it would be good to see that again, just to see what Mark is capable of doing on another bike. Honda will do everything they can to keep him because at the end of the day, he's top Honda man. There is nobody that performs like Mark Marquez has on their mark. Will they be able to produce a motorbike that works this year? Well, you know, based on the, the, the small amount of testing that we've seen so far, no, it doesn't look like they're going to. It looks like he's going to be struggling with with a motorbike that doesn't work particularly well again. It was, it's going to be down to Mark Market. No wonder he's training as hard as he is, that's for sure. Um, he's trying to make it all up in the, in the in the gym, I think, at the moment. Honda's a big company. You know, they've, they've done it before. They're going to have to do it again. But at the minute, they are behind hugely. Will that tempt him to go to take a risk with an emerging KTM, perhaps? You know, Ducati would be the obvious choice, but then would Ducati sign Marquez? Because if he wins, it will be good because of Mark Marquez. If he loses, it will be because Ducati is not good enough. It's a kind of a bit of a poison chalice, really, for for a manufacturer to take on Mark Marquez. Um, so I think he'll stay with Honda. Will the Honda actually perform this year? I've got my doubts um, because I think everyone is already, a, you know, a, a fair way in front of them. 
Um, it will be interesting to see what they pull out of the bag when we get to the test proper in a couple of weeks. It's going to be brilliant. I think the two obstacles between going to Ducati, if you like, is the money side of it. And Keith hinted at this in the big, the big deals with, let's say, Rossi and Lorenzo before. Do you take that big amount of money and spend it on the rider or do you spend it on the bike? And we've seen that Ducati tried it with the riders and they didn't get the, the success they wanted, did they? They put the money into the bikes signed up a load of young guys on, on, on much less money and they get the title with Banyaya. So I think we've seen them pick their direction in that sense. Would they go against that and switch back the other way and throw money at Mark? Also, you know, normally you'd have a big sponsor to pay for that, wouldn't you? You'd want someone to come in who's going to foot the bill for a big name like Mark. The other thing is, what about Mark's team? You know, he's been with all that crew, just like Rossi and, and, and his, his crew, wasn't it? You know, are Honda going to let him take that crew away? Will Ducati want them? They would then have to make all of their own crew redundant, if you like, to, to accommodate Mark. And then if Mark leaves, of course, it's, it's a bit like with Rossi when he changed teams. You lose not only the rider, you lose your whole, your whole team. And I don't, think, I don't think Ducati would be prepared to do that. So Mark would have to go it alone almost. And so then the question becomes, how badly does he want the world championship? Because the Ducati is the bike to be on right now. No doubt about it. He's saying that saying about the problems with the Honda. I mean, you would clearly, you would back Mark to win championships on the Ducati much, much more than the Honda at the moment. So th those are the obstacles I see, but you know, we're seeing Mark talk more publicly and ramp the pressure up, aren't we? On, on Honda about making clear that kind of, look, I'm back in shape now. Now it's about the bike. He's, he had all that success and then it suddenly stopped and he's had three years where he's had a couple of wins, isn't it? In, in 21 and that was it but the championships have dried up and he's not getting any younger, as, as Keith said. Is this also why we've, we see him in the gym? We saw Rossi do that. As you get older, the, the riders that used to just rely on, I mean, Mark was always in good shape, wasn't he? But I mean, the riders, as they got older, have to work more in the gym, have to, have to, have to work that a little bit harder. It's, it, it doesn't just come as naturally, it seems, to keep up with the younger guys. And I think, you know, Mark wants those championships and big year, as Keith says, also for Honda because... Maybe, maybe not to win the championship this year, but he's going to need to see the improvements. You've got Ken Kawachi coming in from Suzuki. Is that going to make the difference? We'll have to wait and see. But he's going to want to see that that bike is going in the right direction because time's running out for him, isn't it? I mean, how many years is he willing to wait before his next title, if you like? He, you know, he's been through so much. He clearly wants it, but he's been stuck on those six MotoGP titles since 2019. So, yeah, I, I, I think it's um, there's some big obstacles in there, and I'm not sure Ducati are going to bend over backwards. They don't need to. They've got the best bike on the grid. They're the reigning champions. But if, if Marc Marquez came to your door and said, give me the piece of paper, I'll sign, he doesn't need the money, does he? So, uh, you know, you wouldn't turn him away. There's another element to it as well, of course. Mark Marquez opened the door for Alex Marquez at Honda. I wonder if Alex Marquez will open the door for Mark Marquez at Ducati. You know, at the end of the day, he's, he's got a bit of an inside line there, hasn't he, to what's going on. So interesting dynamic in 23 on so many fronts. It really is, isn't it? Uh, thank you, uh, Dean, for that question. Now, we've got, we're not going to be able to get through everyone, but don't worry, we're back next week, so I'll roll them over to them. But I thought we've got time for one more, um, which is aimed at you, Keith, specific, specifically. Sorry, Pete. Uh, but it's from 13-year-old uh, Riley. Um, hello, this is a uh, question for Keith. Um, Keith, wh what is it like? Are you able to give us a like in-depth explanation of what your experience in the the paddock was not only in grand prix but in motorcycle racing in general because it's so fascinating to to know what you know these riders go through um nearly on a weekly basis during the racing season Riley, thank you very much for that question. Well, I mean, the, the <laughs> motorcycle paddock is a is a fantastic place to live. There's no doubt about it. And it is a circus of people that are traveling from country to country or you know if you're only doing british championships from circuit to circuit everybody knows everybody you know this in the british championship for instance families gen generally are there you know you've got wives girlfriends uh, mums dads uncles aunts uh, that, are, that are at trackside as well so it's got a very good family atmosphere um there's a bit more access for the fans to get into a, a british championship type paddock where the interaction between riders and, and everyone else around the, the court, particularly if you get there a little earlier in the week, you can you can really rub shoulders with everybody and everyone's got time. The further up the scale you go, the, the, the more difficult it is. World Superbike is still, the access is still, still, still brilliant. I mean, it's a little 
less competitive in the paddock, no less competitive out on the racetrack, of course. Everyone's pushing and shoving out there. But there's a very friendly atmosphere in a World Superbike paddock. In a MotoGP paddock, less so. Probably more down to the fact that factories are much stricter regarding... It's a prototype series at the end of the day. So there are secrets. There are things that, you know, that they don't want to share with any competitors. Back in the day... You know, mechanics from each and every team would mix in the bar, would mix in the uh, over a barbecue, would would spend time interacting around the paddock. Nowadays, that doesn't happen. You don't see Yamaha guys out with Ducati guys in the pub or down at the restaurant or whatever it is. They stick to their own teams. You know, even within a team, you know, like seamless gearboxes. Let's talk seamless gearboxes. Is one of my favourite term subjects. No one outside of the seamless gearbox guy sees the seamless gearbox pretty much i mean i always remember asking cal crutzlow have you ever seen one he, he said no it comes in in a box you know it gets loaded into the bike and the old one gets taken out and put in a box and shipped off again from honda and you never get to see it so he'd never seen one at that point i don't know whether it's got any more relaxed in the last year or two since i've not been around in the paddock but um it is a much even down to to getting in and out of a paddock you know your pass, you can't you can't walk in and, and the gate man wave your pass at him and wander through and then pass it back through the fence for your mate to come through like you're used to. Nowadays, the pass only works. It beeps you in, it beeps you out. And if you've made the mistake of making a mistake, then um, you lose your pass and you have to pay a fine. So it's, it's a lot harsher. It's not Formula One, by the way. We've not got to the point where, you know, your pass only gets you into a certain zone in the paddock. Formula One, I mean, if you're a broadcaster, my broadcast pass would get me anywhere i wanted to go in in a motorbike paddock but in a formula one paddock your broadcast pass uh, depending on what one it is of course and there's several variations of it um will only get you in the telecompound so you'll see less than the fans on the side of the track pretty much you've got a working pass to get you in just a fenced area where you work um it's similar in motor gp in that your pass is have certain colours attached to them. If you've got a media pass, an orange pass, for instance, you can get in the media centre and anywhere behind the pits and at certain times in front of the pits. But it's broken down into a timing thing. If you've got a, a blue pass, it gets you in other places. You've got a red pass, you can get out on the grid. You know, there are different segments of... of, of and quite rightly, I've got to say, um, if we go back to the days when pit lane was full of meandering idiots that were sort of walking in the way and there was a guy killed um in pit lane when a rider came down pit lane the rider hit his head on a on the the pit wall because i I don't know who it was a photographer i think it was that stepped backwards into the pit lane there's so many people in pit lane that shouldn't be there in some respects and right the way from bsb through world superbike and motor gp that's been cut down quite rightly but riley it's a great place to be if you're thinking about it associate with with a team get in touch with a team if you want to be a runner for a team you don't even have to be you don't have to have a, a, much of an education or or specific exams or anything along those lines if you if you're an enthusiast towards motorcycle racing you know and you get to know some of the smaller teams at a british championship race meeting you know, or even a club level if you go club racing you know club racing is still some of my favorite spectating opportunities there are because you can go anywhere speak to anyone and it's just great fun associate with a team and you'll slowly move through the rank um i can't recommend it any better than that it's, it's still an environment that is open to all if if you want to make the effort if you are passionate about it then there are opportunities at trackside to move through to be part of a team you end up but you start being a gopher you know we always used to say yesterday's team bloody truck driver ends up being the team manager jeremy burgess there you go valentino rossi's top man right up until rossi fired him unceremoniously in sepang i think it was actually now i come to think of it um jeremy burgess first time i met jerry burgess he was he was driving the bloody suzuki bus you know and he ended up being the guru of the paddock as it turns out so there's there's opportunities because it's not just about technical excellence; it's about managing to interpret. This could be. A, you, you did ask for an in-depth. Answer. Yeah, I, I was about to say you shouldn't have asked in-depth, Riley. You shouldn't no, have you asked Keith for an in-depth <laughs> answer. <laughs> well, Riley's probably the one and only person interested in this, but 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 you, it's about the interaction between rider and crew chief. You know, crew chief's interpretation of what a rider is saying. That's a whole new podcast on its own. Uh, how he interprets it and how he then translates that through your tech guys through your your it guys and so on and, and and makes that motorbike a little bit better it's a wonderful subject 
after all these years, I'm still as passionate about it now as I ever was when I was 15 when I first went. And I think that um, if you if you feel the same way, then get on board. Um, come and join the boys at Trackside. Have a wander around, you know, with your mum and dad and uh, meet the people. And you'll meet some wonderful people at all levels of the sport. Absolutely. I can maybe just add a little bit of a story to, to Keith there about, the, you know, the technical side and what teams look for. So um, a lot of my colleagues, if you like, at university went on, we, I studied engineering, went off to, on to work for Formula One teams. So one of the job interviews, this was for an electronic engineer at a Formula One team. They were given a massive code for a car. And, uh, you know, you had, a, you had like an hour to find the fault in the code. Now, it was impossible, it turns out. Okay, and what the team was looking for, because everyone had decent qualifications, they wanted to see how people worked under pressure and how they, how they interacted with the people around them. You know, if someone came over and said, you know, do you want a tea, a coffee, do you want a water? Because it's about the team. It's about being able to work with people. As Keith says, it's not just about, look, I've got the best grades going or, or, or anything like that. You've got to be a team and you've got to be someone that can work with people and that people want to work with. And that's what that team was looking for. They, they, they knew it was impossible to do the job they gave you, but, you know, but they wanted to see how you reacted under pressure like that. Did you start throwing things around or getting angry, snapping at people? All that kind of thing. Quite an interesting one, I thought. But yeah, that was that was one uh, one real life job interview uh, test that they gave at a Formula One team. So uh, wow. yeah, the point is, if you want to be in a team, don't think it's just about academic qualifications or things like that. It's about a lot more than that, as Keith says. And you can go in in any role. You've got to be able to work with people and be a team. Be a team member. Definitely, if you've got you'll passion, have, you'll and- have a great life. That's for sure. Yeah, you could you could be look at Keith and Pete. You could be where they are if you just stick at it. <laughs> I'm in England, freezing to death. He's in Kuala Lumpur. Hang on a second. <laughs> yeah, it could go one of two ways. Uh, but Riley, thank you very much for for your brilliant question. There, you asked for in depth, and you absolutely got it. But it, it was fascinating to to hear. Keith and Pete's uh, uh, insider knowledge there. Uh, Keep your questions coming in. Podcast at crash.net if you want to send us a a voice note question or you could just ping us a normal question either on the email or through the Crash MotoGP social channels. We'd love to hear from you. Sorry we didn't get through everybody, but we will come back to those we missed next time around. We are done. We've run over, but we're done. Thanks to Jake Dixon for joining us as well on the show. We're going to try and bring you a few more guests as the year goes on. But in the meantime, make sure you're tuned in to Crash.net. You can find Pete's good article on, on the uh, on the concession situation, by the way, if you have a little scroll. He forgot about it, but if you scroll, it'll be there somewhere. Uh, make sure you're tuned in on Crash.net. All the latest news and analysis, all of Pete's thoughts as well on there, along with the whole MotoGP team uh, at Crash Towers. We'll be back next week and with you every week now. We're back running up and normal as we head towards the start proper of the 2023 season get your questions in follow us give us a like just search crash moto gp hit that subscribe button if you're watching on youtube leave us a review that really helps on stuff like apple podcasts if you can Uh, and we shall see you right back here next week but from myself harry benjamin from pete mclaren and from keith ewan bye-bye